We're going to look at Psalms 24, 25, and 26 today. Here in Psalm 24, we have an opportunity to see uh, the psalmist David who is celebrating. He's celebrating the fact that God is the king of Israel. And in Psalm 24, we're going to see that David presents God in three ways. He presents God to us as the creator. He presents God to us as one who is holy. And he also presents to us that God is the glorious king. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 24, reading to verse 10, David writes, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Now, God is the glorious King. But this glorious king intends to rule over willing subjects. And the way that his subjects, those who are willing to be ruled over by him, demonstrate that they are willing to be his subjects is for them to be living pure lives. Because the manner in which a person lives reveals whether God is their king or not. The way that I live demonstrates whether or not I really am a servant of God. And so this is what we're looking at here. He begins first by reminding us that God is the glorious king, the creator of all things, and owns all things. Notice how he says in verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything that has been created was created by him, and therefore he owns everything, everything that's on the earth everything that the earth is, including that which dwells upon it or within it. And so everything belongs to him because he created it and he owns it. You see this witness throughout Scripture. We could multiply various Scriptures to demonstrate this to you, but let me share a couple of them. For example, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 10, verse 14, uh, Moses writes, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. Everything belongs to him. Psalm 89, verse 11, The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all its fullness, you have founded them. And finally, in Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, we read, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And so the Bible makes it very clear that the earth belongs to the Lord by virtue of creation, and everything in it is His. Even when I give to Him something, I'm only giving to Him what he, out of what He has already given to me. I have never owned anything outright because it's all been given to me anyway. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, Everything that is in it belongs to him. He founded it, notice in verse 2, upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Now, this isn't saying that he believes that the earth floated in some cosmic ocean. Some people would think that. It's just another way of saying that God establishes order. And this speaks really of the stability of God in creation. Psalm 96.10 says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved he shall judge the peoples righteously. So this is the God who establishes the earth. This is the God who owns all things. So as creator, he is awesome and powerful and majestic and mighty. So the question has to be asked, then who can dwell with him? What kind of person can have fellowship with a God who created all things? There's this show some people watch. I haven't watched the show. I've seen excerpts in the news, The Apprentice. And there are a lot of people, apparently, who enjoy watching 
Donald Trump say you're fired? And, um, you know, and their people are quivering in their boots before Donald Trump, but Donald Trump will be quivering in his boots before Jesus Christ because he can't fire Jesus. And see, so we have to understand some things. You see, sometimes we can have this, this sense of dread and awe uh, concerning our boss or concerning some celebrity, concerning somebody with some kind of power. And sometimes that's understandable because you can stand before a judge knowing very well that he has the power to put you in jail or set you free and all. And there are people who have tremendous concern, of course, when they stand before the judge. But that's an earthly judge. How do you have confidence when you stand before the judge of the world? Well, he tells us here in verse 3, when he asks first the question, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? What kind of person is going to be able to have a relationship with a God like this? And then he tells us in verse 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. I want you to notice when he speaks of a clean hand and a pure heart, he speaks very much concerning the way a person lives their life. When he says, he who has clean hands, the words clean hands speaks about a person's behavior, his actions. And these are actions that spring from a heart that is pure. The pure heart speaks of the attitude, the attitude of the heart that is devoted to God. When he says he has not lifted up his soul to an idol, this speaks of his affections because he loves God first. When he says, nor has he sworn deceitfully, this speaks of his integrity towards other people. Clean hands, pure heart, has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, speaks of a committed believer. That's what this describes for us, somebody who is committed to following God with all of their heart, a committed believer. Now, remember with me in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, you might want to turn there briefly, Matthew chapter 22. Remember with me concerning an incident in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It serves to illustrate the point that I'm about to make when I speak concerning a, a committed believer, a person with clean hands, a person with a pure heart, a person who hasn't lifted up their soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, a person whose actions and, and attitudes and affections demonstrate that they truly know God, that they are committed, a committed believer. In Matthew 22, Jesus speaking concerning that, verses 36 following to verse 39. The question is asked of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice with me that Jesus said you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. He didn't say with some of it or a portion of it or a dedicated time-wise, time phrase, you know, frame, portion of it. You shall love the Lord your God on whatever day you choose to. If, you, if it's Sunday, fine. Love them on Sundays. If it's, if it's uh, Sunday night, great. Love them Sunday night. If you love them Sunday morning and Sunday night too, that's wonderful. Wednesday, praise God, that's good too. He didn't say that. He said, and this is so convicting to me, to be honest with you. So convicting, I want it to convict you too. Because um, I love you. But he says, he says, love God with everything that is within you. Not just a little portion of it. I mean, it, when I asked Marie, my wife, to marry me, I, I wanted all of her. I wanted her complete affection. I wanted her complete devotion to me as a husband in the proper, proper way. If she just said, you know what? I, I will love you on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but the rest of the time is my own. I don't think I'd feel very comfortable with a woman who loved me like that. I want somebody who's committed to me because I want to be firmly and completely committed to her. And that's just natural in relationships. You get married... You want to get married with this attitude that we love each other with all our heart and there'll never be anybody who will, who will break us up. There'll never be anybody who comes between our affection that we have one for another. We love each other completely and totally. That's how you get into a marriage. That's how you remain married. Well, in your relationship with God, it's a complete, total commitment. And that's what Jesus said. What's the great commandment? What's the, what's the number one commandment? Love the Lord thy God with everything that is within you. And by the way, he says... Uh, that loving God has application 
Because there are those who say they love God, but they blow up people. They will tell you they love God, but they will blow up a, a, a bus filled with school children in the name of their God. Jesus said, no. Jesus said, when you love God with all of your heart, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And who is my neighbor? Everybody, Jesus would say, is your neighbor. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you see. And so what we're called to is a full commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. In another place, in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, uh, Jesus was speaking to somebody, and he said, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It's a full commitment to the Lord that he calls us to. Now, D.L. Moody, a great preacher of another time, said this. D.L. Moody said, The first thing a man must do if he desires to be used in the Lord's work, is to make an unconditional surrender of himself to God. He must consecrate and then concentrate. A man who does not put his whole life into one channel does not count for much. And the man who only goes into work with half a heart does not amount to much. When you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, then you're becoming a disciple. When you're committed, and that's what we're speaking about back in Psalm 24, when he said, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands, a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. The kind of person who does that is a man or a woman who is committed to God. And the result back in, in chapter 24, or Psalm 24, verse 5, is that he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your faith. So he receives reward. There's a reward for this kind of life. Some people think, man, if I, if I follow the Lord with, with all of my heart, then I'm going to live a very bored life. I used to think that way. I thought, well, I'll become a Christian or a, a genuine believer. I'll commit myself more fully after I've, I've lived for a while and, and, and all, and I thought that, that, that people who followed God must live exceptionally bored lives. But our life, my life isn't boring. I don't know if yours is, but my life most certainly is not a boring life at all. God has abundantly blessed my life in so many ways and so many challenges and so many experiences. There have been times when I've been in a different land, in a different country, and I've been with some friends, and I've looked at them, and I've said, can you believe it? We're in this country preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've said to them, people like Pancho and others, we hang around, and we've been to different countries together, and I've said, can you believe it? Pancho, can you believe it? That here we are in this country speaking about Jesus Christ when just, you know, when we were young, if you'd have told us, that, that one day we would get on a plane, fly to South America, meet with pastors, minister to them, and have this kind of life, I would have said, you've got to be crazy. Crazy. What an exciting life God has given to us. What a blessed life God has given to us. And so a person who has this kind of commitment is blessed by God. That's what he's saying. He shall receive blessing from the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your faith. He's saying God is going to reward this kind of life. You're going to live a blessed life. When he says in verse 6, this is Jacob. Jacob is another name for Israel. And Israel is the covenant people of God. And so true Israel, which are genuine believers, are those who willingly yield to God as their king. Like faithful Abraham, they have believed and God has counted that as righteousness. And so the Lord is blessing them in that way. So he goes on and speaks of the glorious king, and he says in verse 7, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now when he speaks concerning lifting up your heads, O you gates, this is a picture of the city of Jerusalem. He's saying, open wide your gates and welcome your triumphant King. The glorious King who has conquered his enemies now comes to rule and now he comes to reign. This Creator 
this king, this warrior God is now dwelling in the midst of those who love him. And the Bible tells us again in the Psalms, in Psalm 72, 11, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Ultimately, when Jesus Christ rules and reigns, the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is the one who fulfills us. He is the King of glory. Now in Psalm 25, moving on, another psalm, a psalm of David. David says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. When I was a very young Christian, somebody actually put music to this particular psalm, and we used to sing this psalm. Uh, portions of the words from the first few verses here when we were going to, when I was in Calvary Chapel in the early days of my walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a psalm that speaks concerning the fact that David has gone through many trials and has had many adversities. And this has been called a song of lament. Now he's gone through some tough times, but the result is, and you'll see this as we go through this, the result has been that it has caused him to look at his own heart as he's gone through this adversity. You see, how a person deals with hard times reveals much about that person. David sees chastisement from the Lord as good because it produces humble dependence on God. In Psalm 119, verse 67, we read, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. I believe very strongly that the tough times and afflictions, sometimes the adversities that we go through, have a way of, of demonstrating or, or revealing the quality of, of faith that we have, the depth of commitment that we possess. I believe very strongly that every person goes through hard times that is something we're not exempt from. I used to wish that I could give a message where I would say to people, if you come to Jesus Christ, you will never have another problem in your life. You will have a magic wallet. Every time you pull it out, it will have you know pictures of dead presidents and it'll be just wonderful. You'll, 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 it's, just, it's never empty. You know, you'll never cry again. You'll only laugh all the time. You'll never be sick ever again. Everything is just going to be great. You know, but that's not the truth, is it? When I first got saved, you know, everything went great, and that's true. It went great for the first few days. And after that, you know, the rest has been, you know, history. I've been learning lessons since then. And adversity, the things that you go through are the things that strengthen you. The things that you go through are the things that cause you to be able to develop perseverance and endurance. They're the kinds of things that, that, that uh, fashion your faith and, and, and teach you how to fall on your face before God and to, and to cry for other people and, and, and how to deal with anger and how to deal with disappointment. And all of this comes through adversity, and through adversity comes strength. And so David is saying, I have learned some lessons and therefore, I'm saying, God, I'm lifting up my soul to you. And I don't want to be ashamed. Don't let my enemies triumph over me. I'm going to wait on you, and therefore, I will not be ashamed. Let those be ashamed, he says in verse 3, who deal treacherously without a cause. If a person, gets, if a person is ashamed, let it be a person who needs to be ashamed. But I'm confident, he's saying, I'm confident that my enemies are the ones who will be shamed when you help me. In Psalm 33, verse 20, we read, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. So he says in verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Your way, your path reveals intimate fellowship with God. It speaks of a manner of life that is after God. When he says, lead me in your truth, this is what motivates the way that we live because truth informs us. Truth teaches us how to live. I want to walk your way. I want to live a life that is 
that is like yours. I, I don't want to be, David would be saying, and I think we could agree with him and say the same. I don't win, want to be the kind of person who's always got a ready answer for somebody else with no experience in that area myself. Um, it's kind of difficult sometimes, not to say that we have to go through every, every single sinful temptation to be able to identify with everybody. I, I, in other words, don't think that it's necessary for me to go through a divorce to be able to identify with somebody who's hurting because they are. I don't think we have to go through s certain situations to have strength, but I have discovered that that um, some of the things that we go through are very similar. All of us have been disappointed. All of us have had times of tears and sorrow. All of us have suffered loss. And, and I think that brings us all closer to God and one to another if we allow it to. And I believe very strongly, as David is speaking here, that David is simply saying, I want to know you in an intimate way. Uh, in John's Gospel, in chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, and what he's saying is, I want intimate fellowship with you. In John 15, 12 and 13, Jesus said this. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay one's life down for his friends. Lord, I want to learn to lay my life down for my friends, I was reading something yesterday, and I hope I can remember enough of it to, to make sense of it to you, where an individual was saying something, and I thought, I, and it's true, and that's why I'm repeating it to you. He said, we are in an election year. In as much as we're in an election year, he says, the party that wants office is going to now take some time to tell you why life is worse now than it's ever been before. He says, now, in as much as the Republicans are in office right now, the Democrats will be taking that tact. He said, but when the Democrats were in office, the Republicans used that. He said, that is typical of politics, and we all know that. We're all old enough to say, yeah, I know that. So it's an election year, and so you're about to hear that this is the worst of times that you've ever experienced before. How did we make it through the last three years without their help? He says, and yet, at the same time, he says, if you just look at your society, you know, for example, gasoline prices, people are saying we're at a point of crisis, you know, because it's going to near $3 a gallon. That's because we're Americans, and we don't live in France, and we don't live in Spain, we don't live in Europe, where $3 is cheap for a liter of gas. Over here, we spend that for a gallon, maybe, and, uh, and people say, oh, I'm being robbed at the pump. He said, we right now have diseases that are basically extinct. The American health care is the best in the world. And the privileges and the blessings that we have are manifest. We have so many things that we should be grateful for. He said, yet, as Americans, we seem to only be happy when we're bummed out about something, when we're complaining about something when we see a need for something. We say that we're poor because we can't afford to go to the restaurant we want to as we're eating a McDonald's hamburger. We've got the extra money to buy things like that, but we say we're poor. We say we're poor because we can't get the kind of jacket or clothing that we'd like, but we're not naked. We do have clothes. And we have learned to grumble and complain. And he said one of the ways to deal with this he says, is why don't you learn to stop looking at yourself and start looking at other people? If you started caring for somebody else instead of yourself so much, you might find joy in service. But the average American, even American Christian, is so caught up saying, I want it my way or it's the highway, that we don't understand that in, in losing ourselves, we actually find ourselves. In dying to ourselves, we actually come alive. In serving, we actually receive blessing. And so the point is, is that we need to learn to die to those things and stop being so spoiled. And unfortunately, we all, of course, are to some degree spoiled and, and all. And, and so bottom line is, is what we want to learn is the ways of the Lord and the paths of God. 
We want to understand that the Lord is the one who is our help. The Lord is the one who takes care of us. The Lord is the one who leads us intimately. The, one, the Lord is the one who teaches us that it's more blessed to give than to receive, that we lay our lives down for our friends. And Jesus Christ wants to have an intimate relationship with us, and part of the way that he does is through the afflictions that we suffer through so that we fall on our face before God and say, God, help me. I have no, I have no strength without, without you. And if you don't help me, Lord, I'm going to fail. So he says to us here in Psalm 25, verse 6, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. In my younger days, I may have sinned against you, and I didn't even know that I was doing it. But based on your mercy, I ask that you would blot out my sins. Do you know I have discovered that it is possible to be sinning against the Lord and not even know that you are? Not even to realize that you are doing something wrong. One of the ways to discover what is right and wrong is just to spend time devotionally in the Word of God. To pick up the Bible on a daily basis and read through it and, 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 and make that your goal to take uh, the Word of God into your life every day. And you will discover His ways and you will be taught His paths. And then you'll discover that some of the things that you argue vehemently that they're okay, you're going to discover that some of those things you think are okay, God is saying, no, but they're not okay. They're not okay. We have people who, who think it's okay to live with their girlfriends because after all, we love one another. And then you read the Bible and it says, no, that's called the sin of fornication. We have people who say, well, you know what? I don't get paid enough, you know, and, you know, there's some extra cash there and I could use it to, you know, and, you know, I'll give myself a raise. You know, maybe I'll pay them back sometime. I don't know. And it, they'll never notice it. You know, when I used to work for Sears, I was 18 years old, and they had me in the back. And I was, you know, stocking shelves and everything, and, and, and I saw a shirt here and a T-shirt there, and I thought, well, you know what? They Look at all of these shirts and T-shirts. You know, I mean, they won't miss one, you know? And I would take them, you know, and I'd say, they're insured. They're insured. And I used to work at a supermarket, you know. I'd, I'd be in the back there in the ice box. And I'd say, you know, that, that looks pretty good. And there's nobody watching me. Boom, you know, you know, there's plenty more here. And I'd steal the cigarettes, you know. I got fired from both of those jobs. <laughs> but there are a lot of people like that. Well, I'm making, you know, very little, and it's, nobody's going to miss this. And then you, then you start reading the Bible, and the Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And you go, whoa, you know, I... You know, you're not to fornicate. Whoa, you know, I didn't even realize that was in the book. And so there are things that we can do in life without even knowing they're wrong. You get into the Word and God reveals to us. And there are things that, that we have done. When he says, do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions, that's basically what he's speaking about. And he's asking for mercy. That's why he says in verse 7, according to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. The humble, he guides in justice. The humble, he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. So, good and upright is the Lord. God is good, notice with me, upright, merciful, and truthful. And based on these attributes, he teaches the humble. Because sinners need his mercy and sinners need his truth. He reveals himself so, so that we can know him. And he forgives us because he is merciful. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 43, 25, God speaking, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. So he says, Lord, in mercy, in mercy, pardon my iniquity because it is great. Verse 12, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So fear of God produces a motivation in our life to learn his ways. Notice how he says the humble continually seek mercy and forgiveness and instruction from his word. And the result is that they follow his path and are blessed by God in every way possible. 
Now notice with me in verse 11, in verse 14 rather, how he says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He will show them his covenant. And I was thinking of that as I was reading that, the secret of the Lord. God, in other words, um, confides in those who fear him. It reminds me of how, how the Lord ministered uh, to some of those in the Old Testament like Abraham and, and, and Moses. You see, in Genesis, in chapter 18, the Lord God is there speaking to Abraham. And Abraham and the Lord are having a conversation, and God is speaking to him concerning the blessings that are going to come into Abraham's life. And uh, as they're having this conversation, it's interesting how in Genesis 18, verses 17 and 18, uh, it's recorded that the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Abraham, I'm going to confide in you. Abraham, I'm going to share something with you. And that's what he means in verse 14 when he says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Abraham, I'm going to tell you what I'm about to do. And then he goes on to say, He says, I, I have heard of the evil, in other words, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah's evil has, has reached to heaven, and I'm going there and checking it out myself, and I'm going to judge them. God confides in him and speaks to him and shares with him what he's about to do. The Bible tells us concerning Moses in Exodus 33, verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so God would have conversation in an intimate way, and God confides in us. The secret of the Lord is, those, is with those who fear him. I'm reminded of Jesus when he's speaking to his disciples in John 15, verse 15. And he says, No longer do I call you servants. A servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father. I have made known to you. I have confided these things in you. And so, guys, that applies to us too. The Lord opens up and reveals to us his heart through his word. And when you spend time reading, he actually unveils to you. Now, there are some things. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord, but those things that are revealed belong to us and future generations. There are some things that perhaps we will not know because God chooses not to reveal, but there are so many other things that God desires to confide in us if we would only open our hearts to him. So he says, My eyes are ever toward the Lord. He shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I'm desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Oh, bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many. They hate me with cruel hatred. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. And that's something that we could even be praying to this day. David confesses his sin before God with the expectation of being forgiven and guided by him. Notice how he, he asks God to forgive him and to deliver him from his enemies and from his affliction. But notice also that he does so confidently, and this is because he has put his trust in the Lord. That's what he says in verse 20, Keep my soul, deliver me, let me not be ashamed. I put my trust in you. The word trust can also be my confidence or my hope in you. I put my faith in you. Psalm 9, verse 10 says, Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it, and will he not do it? God is able to perform that which he has said that he would perform. So we, took, we trust him. We take him at his word. Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. 
I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with a voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not gather my soul together with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. As for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place in the congregations. I will bless the Lord. So David makes it clear in Psalm 26 that he has decided to follow the Lord again with a true and total commitment. Notice how he's speaking of walking in integrity and in trust and in the truth that God has given to him. The Proverbs in chapter 10, verse 9 says, He who walks with integrity walks securely. In verses 4 and 5, he says, I have not sat with idolatrous mortals. In other words, I do not fellowship with wicked people. I don't, I don't fellowship with those who are idolatrous or hypocrites or evildoers or those who are simply wicked. Why is that? Well, if you take notes, you might want to note this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Very good scripture. It's one of those scriptures that I tried to teach my kids. I don't think they learned it. But they are learning it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not, be, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Evil company corrupts good morals. Choose wisely who you hang around with. Choose wisely who you allow to influence you. Choose wisely what you watch. Choose wisely what you listen to. Choose wisely where you go. Because... I've said this to you before. Your pastor isn't necessarily me. Your pastor is the person who influences your decisions spiritually. And some people in this fellowship have had friends who they've been with in church, they've heard a message, and their friends have tried to convince the person who was convicted by that message to ignore that message. Let me give you one example. I could multiply this many times over. I had a young woman approach me probably about 13 years ago now, and she's no longer in our fellowship. She's, she's uh, moved away, and I'll share with you in a moment about that. But I had a young woman approach me after a Bible study. I was teaching a certain passage that related to, um, to sexual sin. And the particular sin that it related to was the sin of homosexuality. And so I shared what the Scripture has to say concerning homosexuality and the variety of things that are found in that passage, as I normally do. Well, this young woman approaches me about two weeks after I had taught that study, and she introduced herself to me. She says, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is, and she gave me her name. She says, um, Pastor, I was in the Bible study Wednesday night, couple of weeks ago she says and you need to know that I had a live-in girlfriend she says I've been a practicing lesbian for many years she said you were teaching the Bible and as you taught the Bible you were reading from that passage and she said my heart was touched by that so my girlfriend and I went home and had a conversation about the Bible study she says it's our first time here she said my girlfriend said well, oh, that's just his opinion. She said, but I said, no, that's what the book actually says. She said, and he wasn't giving his opinion. He was telling us what it says. She says, and you know what? It's true. To make a very long story short, she said, I broke up with that girl. A few years later, several years later, she approached me to tell me I'm getting married. She's married, and she moved out of state and serving the Lord. You see, God has a way of touching you through his word. But there are people who will hear that and will say, no, that's their opinion. And it's normally in an area where they are, they are convicted. And sometimes they get upset. Sometimes they want to argue vehemently. I've had people in this church during service who've been arguing with me as I'm teaching. And they're speaking loudly. I had somebody in Christmas, in the Christmas services, get up in the back and he turned around and and gave me the California howdy. <laughs> wasn't very happy with the message. Wasn't happy with me. And they do that. 
You know, the same message that will speak to your heart and say, I want to get closer to God, is a message that causes somebody else to be angry and resentful and, and sometimes even hate-filled towards you. Same message. And the Lord wants to give us His truth. And we have sometimes people that we are with, guys, who, who we allow to influence us away from where God wants to move you. I remember an argument that took place in a church service on a Wednesday night when I gave an invitation and a young man and his girlfriend were in the back of the church and the girl wanted to come forward and the young man got angry and made a big scene in the back of the church with her forbidding her from giving her heart to Jesus Christ. And that happens more often than, than you might imagine where somebody is listening to a message and God is moving but the person that they allow to influence them is arguing hammer and tong with that message because it's calling for a change in their life. But I discovered something a long time ago. If you pick up a rock and throw it into a pack of dogs, the one that barks is the one who got hit. And there are times when people get so convicted, you know, that they respond like that. I like that one. That's a good one. And so... He says in verses 6 through 8, I will wash my hands in innocence. I will go to your altar, O Lord. He's saying my worship is with purity, with innocence, and with sincerity. And because of this, I can witness to others of your goodness. Notice what he says in verse 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I love to go. It, it, we'll bring it up to 21st century standards and apply it to the church. Lord, I love to go to church. Lord, that's what he's saying. I love to have a relationship with you in the tabernacle during that day because the temple had yet to be built. His son Solomon builds the temple. But the point he's making here is I love to go to the habitation of your house. Lord, I love to fellowship with you in the place that you appear, in that area, in the tabernacle. In our era, it's the church that the Lord meets, meets us. I love to go there. Like the psalmist says in Psalm 122, he says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 84, 1 and 2, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I love to fellowship with you. I love to be with people who fellowship with you, Lord. I love the habitation of your house. I love going to church. I love being around people who love you. Let's face it, guys, all day long we go through the world. We walk in the world. Our feet get dirty through the world. And then you get a chance to go to church and to be with like-minded people, with people who love the Lord, with people who love to sing songs to God, people who are, who are good people because they love Jesus Christ. I love to go to church. I love to be, I've told people this, this is the truth. If I weren't the pastor of this church, I'd go to this church because I like this church. I do. I like you. I, what I'm saying is I like you guys because you are the church. You know, I love you guys and I, and I enjoy being with you. You know, to me, this is what life is. It's Christ and serving Him and being with people like-minded like that. That's what it's all about. Because let's face it, man, you go out into the world and you walk the streets and you do what you got to do. And it isn't always pleasing. It's not always pleasant. And sometimes it's just downright hard. But man, it's Wednesday night. I can go and sing to Jesus and I can go and get a Bible study and I can hang around with some people. And man, I love that. And that's what David is saying. I love to go to church. In verse 9, Do not gather my soul together with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands is a sinister scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. Don't condemn me with those who have rejected you. I'm not like them. I'm not one of them. I have forsaken sin, and I've trusted in you. And so, Lord, don't, don't judge me with those that you're going to reject. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. You see, sin is not welcome in heaven. Sin is not welcome in the presence of God. So he's saying, I have forsaken that so please don't count me as a sinner don't count me in that way because I have followed you 
Verse 11, as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me, be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place in the congregations. I will bless the Lord. I will continue walking with you. I will habitually do what is right. I will stand in the midst of those who have loved you and have served you. And though I may have difficulty along the way, I will not stumble. I will stay strong in you because you have strengthened me. You are the foundation of my life. My foot stands in an even place. So you're walking. You're on level ground. You come to a hill. You don't notice that, there, that there's a bit of a slope. And you take a step and you can trip and fall. David's saying, no, I'm on even ground. I'm on stable ground. There is no place of tripping because I'm firm and I'm founded on you. And God has given to us that stability. Jesus Christ is that rock, and he gives to us the strength to stand. Isaiah tells us this in Isaiah 40, 29. He says, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Jude 1, 24 and 25 says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. He gives power to the weak, increases strength to those who have no might. He is able to keep you from falling. And that's what we trust in the Lord and thank him for. As for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me, be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord.